I think we're going to start a series and that this is the first in that series that we will call Why Haven't You? <laughs> uh, which is the thing. Why haven't you? Um, not as a way of nagging us, you know, uh, or berating us, uh, if you will, calling us into question or into account. Um, you know, you don't answer to me, and that's not the point. Why haven't you, from the sense of what's keeping you, what's stopping you, what's hindering you, what's preventing you, what what's in the way that needs to be removed? Uh, from a problem-solving standpoint, we ask, why haven't you? Because you've got to identify what those things are if you want to remove them. And... Uh, I will assume that you want to remove them. <laughs> the impediments, the blocks, the things that are in the way of doing the work of God, of obeying the Lord, I, I'm going to assume that you don't like those and you don't want them in the way. So we should think about this. I got to thinking about maybe why people have or have not obeyed the gospel. I mean, that's one of those things. Are you a child of God yet? And if not, why not? Um, you should think about that for yourself, not for me, not for the church. You know, it's for you. Maybe you don't know what is happening um, or don't realize what we're called to. Maybe that's the reason. And so we would look, you know, say in Acts chapter 2, you know, with many other words, he bore witness and exhorted them continually, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Yeah. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. This generation is crooked. I mean, that's what we're saying. Uh, you know, this time is not, if you will, is, is not a good time in terms of the spirit. It's crooked. There's, there's corruption. There's evil. People have embraced all kinds of things that are an affront to God and his word. And that's not for us. That being the case... Save yourself from this. You know, pull yourself out. Uh, the idea is a rescue, you know. Pull yourself out. Um, grab hold of that life, life preserver. Don't sink. And those who receive that word in that next verse, those who receive that word were baptized. About 3,000 of them at that time, which is in a you know, somewhat unusual time. I get it. I mean, everybody who believed, who actually believed in God has proven by the fact that they left their home countries to come to Jerusalem to worship at Pentecost uh, was gathered and the word came forth. And yes, in a situation like that, you can add 3,000. There's going to be a whole lot more work leading up to whoever obeys the gospel today, and that's okay. It's not a sign that you're failing or that the word is failing or that times are different. It's, it was an unusual circumstance. But the thing that's the same is those who received it, you know, reception. It's like give it a reception, <laughs> Almost like host a party for it. Do you accept the word of God? Do you understand that this generation is corrupt and you don't need to be like it? You, you can be saved. You can rescue yourself from it. That's the point. Save yourselves from this generation.
yeah, maybe you don't realize how crooked it is. But I would call your attention to Mark 8, 38, where he said, whoever is ashamed of me, Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Yeah, are we ashamed of Jesus and of his words, his teachings in this adulterous and sinful generation? This is the place where we want acceptance? Uh, the place where we want validation is this generation? You know, the producers of The Bachelor and other tripe that's out there, these are the people whose approval you want? You're afraid of offending them? You're afraid of saying things that they don't like? Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words in this place, I'll be ashamed of you when I come back. Yeah, we don't want that. But it's true, a lot of people do want approval from the right and from the left <laughs> instead of from the top. They're looking around at friends and looking around at the world, what's easy, what people go along with, what's accepted, not thinking about the Lord who is above all. Are we ashamed of him? It can be scary to speak up for the Lord. It can be scary to own to his teaching when you know that there are uh, many things arrayed against it, that doing so could make you unpopular or get you canceled. <laughs> Apparently, the worst fate that awaits anybody in public life today is to be canceled. <laughs> but... I will add to this um, that, you know, we who have more experience in life have a very different and, I think, important perspective on reality. We know what reality is, but uh, those who have grown up only recently submerged in the Internet have a very different skewed perception of reality, of what is really out there, how much of it, how common, how uncommon, how people really react and think. They just don't get it. And I think it's important for us to remember things like Mark 838, that this is an adulterous and sinful generation. Don't let your view be skewed. See it the way it really is. And don't be ashamed of the Lord and his words. Those are the only good thing we have. That's why he said what he did. Peter said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. It's You have to step out. You have to make that choice. You know, I mean, is it the case that you don't know? Maybe. Maybe you think that time is on your side. <laughs> uh, you know, people think, well, I'm... You know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm processing. You know, this is one step. This is one, you know, data point that is being taken under consideration. Right? That does not portray urgency. <laughs> 
and could be a reason why, couldn't it? The fact is, uh, in Ecclesiastes 9, you have this that it says, In 11, and yeah, I'd even go to 12 on this deal. He said, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, uh, which you would think it were. Uh, you would think that the swift is the one who wins the race, but no, not always. The battle is not to the strong. You'd think that strength wins the battles, but no, that's not the case. Ask a commander, ask a general. Nor is bread to the wise. Yeah. Having wisdom is not the same as having this world's goods or the ability to gain them or the approval of society, <laughs> nor riches to the intelligent. I mean, haven't we all met these people? Haven't you met the auto mechanic who's the smartest guy you, you've met in a while? <laughs> yeah, of course. Nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance happen to them all. True. Sometimes people are wealthy because of time and chance. They just happen to be born at the right time to the right people. Or they happen to invest at the right time in the right thing. For whatever reason. Man does not know his time, like fish taken in an evil net, like birds caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. This is the way things really are. You know, you get to thinking time is on your side, and, and we've maybe commented on this before, but in our, in our culture in the United States, you know, nobody dies. That doesn't happen. Certainly not today. Everything is about, no, that's not going to happen. There's no embrace of the cycle of life, the turn of events, the eventuality. It's, no, our society just pretends that, no, that won't, that's not going to happen. Certainly not today. But no, that's not true. The truth is, nobody knows their time. <laughs> when it's your time, it's your time, right? When God calls, you're going to pick up. <laughs> that's how it's going to be. <laughs> and it could be in youth, and it could be in old age, and it could be in between, doesn't matter. Fish taken in an evil net. Yeah, the net comes through. The fish don't know anything about a net or what this is or and it doesn't matter how young or how old, how healthy or how sick, how nice or how mean. When the net comes, they're getting out. That's how it is. Same thing for the birds caught in the snare. So also the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. That's the deal. It, it's always a surprise when you die. That's what I'm told. Everybody's surprised to die. <laughs> Suddenly falls upon them. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> it should be a surprise. And even for those who think it's not, then somebody did something intentionally, uh, that's, not, that's not even supported by evidence. I mean, the evidence is that even people who tried to end their time 
everybody who tried and failed said I immediately regretted it as soon as I realized that my life was in danger. Every single person who has ever tried it, that's exactly what they say. So no, no, it's always a surprise. <laughs> People don't realize what's happening. And the, the point that we're making here is not to be morbid. You know, the point of this is, you know, a lot of times people get comfortable like, yeah, you know, there's time. We'll get to that. It's high on the priorities list. <laughs> but no, that's not going to work. You think there is time. There isn't. You don't know. The fact is you don't know. Um, there's a parable that Jesus told in Luke 12. It is captured, Luke 12, and verse 16 is where it begins. He then spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he's a rich man, and he has more crops than he can store. Nothing to do with all of this money. That's what it means. He said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. That is larger. There I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Yeah, you have ample goods laid up for many years. That's the 19th verse. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Which is, you know, there's nothing wrong with retirement. There's nothing wrong with savings. But, uh, you know, that's not your life. And it's not a lease and it's not a guarantee. You know, you could have the money to live for 3,000 years and you're not going <laughs> to. That's not the point, right? The point is the 20th verse. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? That's foolish thinking. That's what that is. It's, it is genuinely foolish thinking. You're thinking to yourself, Oh, you've got plenty. Relax. No, that's foolish if, as the 21st verse points out, so if you are like this, laying up treasure for yourself but not rich towards God. You know, the trick about that that's so interesting, and, uh, you know, Ecclesiastes would agree with us heartily, but the trick about that is that it doesn't matter how much treasure you lay up for yourself if you are not right with God. It's not. It doesn't matter. It's not going to save you. It's not going to help you. It's not going to matter in the judgment, whether you had a, a great deal of money or whether you had almost nothing, lived in squalor and poverty. That's got nothing to do with whether you are right with God. It doesn't make you right to have a lot of money. And it doesn't make you right to be in want or in need. That doesn't mean your cause is just. But the other thing is also true. The opposite is also true. That if you are right with God, then it doesn't matter 
how much money you have or don't have. The important thing, the only lasting, eternal thing is being right with God. Everything else is not worth it. It's going to leave with this world, and you certainly are going to leave it behind. People say the end of the world is, you know, far off or never happening. Well, this is not true. It's going to happen probably inside of 70 years. And now people say, whoa, Zamora's gone. Profit on us. Like, no, no, you're going to die. <laughs> it, you know, if the world ends a thousand years from now, none of us here are going to care because we'll all be dead, long dead and gone. It doesn't matter when the world ends. You know, if you're thinking, oh, long time, far away. No, it could happen today. Uh, you know, it could happen before we finish the sermon, sure. But understand, uh, whether it does or it doesn't, you're not going to be here forever. When's it going to end? Eh, probably inside of 70 years. How can you say that? Well, you're going to die. Your world is going to end. You will exit, not be part of this, not be among the living, not be studying, growing, learning, doing, charity, love, whatever. No, nope, you'll be gone. That's the end for your perspective. So that's what Jesus said um, in Mark 13 is an account where he's talking about the end of the world. Um, and the end of Jerusalem. But as far as the end of the world is concerned, it starts at Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. The word of God is eternal, even if the heaven and the earth pass away. That is, this world, this universe is going to end. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. When is it going to end? Nobody knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That is, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not know the time at which the world will end. That's how unimportant it is. You think about it that way, you know? That's a different perspective, I think. That's how unimportant it is. Is there something we need to know? Is there something pertinent to our daily lives that the Word of God does not provide? That the Son of God is not even aware of? No, there's not. Only the Father knows and that tells us that it just doesn't matter. It's missing the point, trying to know that day and that hour. We know in Acts 17, when Paul was preaching uh, in Greece, he told them, um, that God has fixed a day. at verse 31, fixed a day on which he will judge the world. Um, it's appointed, it's fixed, it's not a moving target, it's not the Lord kind of sustaining, <laughs> waiting for the right time. It's set, we're moving towards it. Jesus continued in Mark 13, be on guard, keep awake. You don't know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge. Each with his work, he commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Yeah, true. <laughs> Therefore, stay awake. You don't know when the master of the house is coming back. In the evening, at midnight, when the rooster crows, in the morning. You don't know when he's coming back. He told you to stay awake. So what are you going to do? you're standing there saying, oh, it's getting late. I wonder when the master's coming back. Well, did he send a message back saying, go ahead and go to bed, I'm delayed? 
No? Well, you better stay awake then. Why did he tell you to stay awake? Maybe he's planning to come back at midnight. You don't know. You don't want him to come suddenly and find you asleep. See, that's Ecclesiastes. It comes on us suddenly. That's how it is. The truth about death, that's how it is. What I tell you, I tell everyone, stay awake. In Mark 13, 37. Yeah, so is that the deal? We, we think time is on our side? You know, we think we got, you know, there's ease, there's time. We, we're, you know, we have a schedule. Like, no, none of that is true. He said, fool, this night your soul is required. Uh, he wasn't expecting that. Why haven't you obeyed the gospel? By which we mean not just become a Christian, but also to do right. The thing that you know that is right, that needs to be attended to. Obey the teaching of the Lord, right? Is it maybe that you're afraid of the wrong things? Not the right things? Uh, fear can keep us from doing a lot of stuff. Fear of rejection, fear of displacement, fear of punishment or consequences. These all prevent us sometimes. Maybe that's the deal. But if you look at Luke 12, you know, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. What a perspective. <laughs> you know, we think there's some terrible things, and there are some terrible things. But all they can do is kill you. As terrible as it might be, and as long as it might take, the worst thing they can do is kill you in the end. After that, they can't do anything more to you. So don't let them make you sin. Because if you sin, then God is against you, and that's a problem when you go into the afterlife. You don't want that. But don't let them make you sin. But, you know, the worst thing they can do is kill you. I mean, in the end, when you die, that's it. And that's the end of man's power. It ends there. No, on the fifth verse, he said, I'll warn you whom to fear instead. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Right. God is the one to fear. If you have to choose between serving God and serving man, serve God. Man might be displeased. Man might torture, maim, or, or kill you. But that's the worst that they can do. Hell is much more serious. I mean, this is, it's not even on the table. They're not even comparable. It is not worth it. You need to be concerned about God. And the fear, he said, fear that when people think fear is a bad thing, that perfect love casts out fear. Uh, and therefore, if you love God or God loves you, then you're not afraid anymore. No, that's not the meaning. The meaning is you have no reason to be afraid when you have perfected your love for God. You can know that you are saved. But you have every reason to be afraid when you are not doing his will, when you are not a faithful child of God. Yes, you have every reason to be afraid. 
And then people will say, oh, you know, he would never send people to hell. He would never do that. That's what they say. You wouldn't do that to your own dog. But I guess they say that the Bible notwithstanding. (laughs) They made that up, you know. There's nothing in the Bible that says that's not so. That's just people making their own emotional arguments about it. But no, he said he would. He destroyed the earth in a flood in the time of Noah. He destroyed Jerusalem by the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. There's no reason to think that he won't do it. He said he would. And that is a serious thing. People say, well, why should you be afraid? Well, because you need something to wake you up. Because, again, (laughs) why haven't you done this yet? Why haven't you obeyed God yet? You need to wake up. That's a real danger. And the lasting one. I think we should close with this thought, which is not mine. This should be in quotations. What will you give in exchange for your soul? It's the Lord's thought. What will you give in exchange for your soul? And we're going to Mark 8 with that. You know, is there something you think is more valuable than your soul? We finished talking about, you know, we finished talking about death and things that can cost you your life and how they're not worth your soul. But when we're talking about the soul, all of those concerns and fears are right. You should be concerned about that soul. You should be worried about the things that are dangerous to your soul. In Mark 8, beginning at verse 34, when he'd called the people to himself and his disciples too, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. For whoever would desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul is there profit in that there's not what can a man give? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Yeah, is there any profit in gaining the whole world at the cost of your eternal soul? There is not. All the riches in the world do not add up to salvation. As we said before, it doesn't matter how much money you have if you are right with God. And if you are wrong with God, it doesn't matter how much money you have. The fact is, being right with God is the only thing that matters. Does it profit a man to gain the whole world at the expense of his soul? It does not. What can a man give in return for his soul? Is there something that is worth the price of your eternal salvation, your eternity in heaven or in hell, is anything worth going to hell for? The approval of your family, the approval of your friends, your neighbors, this world, this government, whatever, is that worth it? No, it's not. You need the approval of God, and you get that 
through his word in obedience to it. And you may have noticed that the 38th verse of Mark 8 is where we started today. Yeah, is this world worth the trade? Jesus said, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Yeah, that's not worth it. It's not a difficult calculus. That's not worth it. You know, that's not a difficult calculus. You know, that's why it comes back to, why haven't you done it? Why haven't you done this? Do you not realize how important this is? Uh, How shameful this world is and how you should be apart from it? Do you not realize that time is not guaranteed and you don't know? Maybe... You're afraid, but if you think about what the scriptures say, are you afraid of the wrong things? Is it God of whom you are afraid? Is there something you think is worth it? Throw everything. You know, well, there isn't. That's not the case, you know? Reason with the scriptures for yourself. We started out with the idea, you know, I mean, in the opening remarks we were talking about, you know, you're not accountable to me, and that's, that is true. Um, in spiritual affairs, you know, regarding your own soul, you are responsible and nobody else. Uh You know, even my children, they're responsible for their own souls. Yes, I bear a charge for them to do right towards them, to teach them what is right, to encourage and make it possible and conducive for them to do what is right. But I'm not the Lord's enforcer. They will believe or they will not believe, and that will be based on God's word. And I don't want it to be based on me, because... I'm fallible, and I'm temporary. It needs to be based on God's word. Because God will never leave you or forsake you. He will be here. And he will be right. Yeah, I try, you know, but I'm just a man. (laughs) Sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I get it wrong. But God is always right, and his word is always right. So no, and I don't think the brethren report to me in this place or any place. (laughs) And if you think that way, then, you know, let's take some time to dissuade you of that matter. (laughs) If you have, you know, about 30 seconds, I could do that. Um, In truth, we are answering to God directly. You know, we have to think about our own souls. We have to reckon and be ready for the judgment day for ourselves. Nobody's going to be able to, you know, die for you or instead of you when your time comes. When your time comes, it's your time. And nobody can stand in your place in the judgment and give answer for you. It, it's you. You made the choices you made. You did the things you did or elected not to do the things that you elected not to do. Um, and even if I love you or, you're, you know, your friends, your families, your congregation love you, they encourage you, they want you to do, they can't answer for you. It's, it's, up, it's up to you. So what are you doing for God and, and 
for things that you know need to be done. Why haven't they been done? And when will that happen? How about today? (laughs) Today is the day of salvation. If you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Get started. Have the Lord forgive you. Have the Lord be on your side. Have him uh, answering your prayers and a mediator on your behalf in Jesus Christ. It's available. It's freely given, though not free. It's paid with the blood of his son. But it's freely given. It's available. We have water ready to, to baptize any who are ready to obey the Lord for themselves. If today you are already a Christian and haven't lived right, repent. Make things right. Begin again to live for God today. Put his things on the forefront. Make that the priority and do it. Why haven't you? We stand ready to pray with you and for you as a Christian. We'll help one another. We stand ready to help you be baptized in the name of Christ. If if you're not yet a Christian, that you might become one. But you'll need to let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front at this time while together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.